1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at this wonderful portion of scripture that we're going to try to get through today and see how Paul begins to assess some of the errors in the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 and on. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God's. Chapter 4, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. More, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. That is the word of the Lord this morning. And the Apostle Paul is making it devastatingly clear what these issues in the Corinthian church keep birthing from. What's the foundation of the Corinthian error? What's the, founda what's the foundation of everything that's going wrong in the Corinthian church that will show us, at least in our modern context, some of the errors that we ourselves are guilty of? And if, if you feel the, the, the tone of these last two, two chapters, ever since chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 3, Paul's tone is, is, is shifting he is exhorting. He is being a pastor. Pastor is not simply making everyone smile and making everyone laugh and have a good time in church. There's moments when the pastor has to confront and address difficult issues. And a lot of people don't like that. And so the, the tone that, that, that Paul takes on these passages are difficult ones. And, and they feel strong because they are. We, we, we heard last week the difficulty that Paul uh, addressed in the Corinthian church about this, this pride that was dividing the church, that was causing divisions among the church. And Paul thought it was so serious that he, he brought down God's wrath upon them. Anyone who divides God's church will be judged by God. And now... He continues with the same tone, emphasizing some error in the church, but at the same time trying to rescue that church for the purposes of God's glory. And so, friends, these are warning signs that we ourselves must be on guard for. Three things in this passage, all the way to chapter 4, verse 5, we are confronted with three issues, and these are the three issues that Paul is confronting the Corinthian church. And the first issue that we're going to address stems in verse 18 through 20. And the first issue is self-deception. He confronts human self-deception and selfish boasting. That's why he starts off, who do you think you are? That's the modern equivalent of that Greek phrase that we'll read again in verse 18. And then he goes on in verses 21 through 22 to address another critical issue. He addresses the, the fact of how we are to think about our leaders. Sorry, that's in chapter 4. How we are to think about our leaders. 
And then, at the end of that section, verses 3 through 5 of chapter 4, he addresses the desperate praise that everyone seeks. And he asks the question, or he implies the question, who do you want praise from? So these are three critical areas in Paul's case of how to address and fix the situations that are occurring in the Corinthian church. Wants to get rid of self-deception, wants people to have a proper view on church leadership, and also wants people to realize that their praise should come from God and not from human wisdom. So let's get started this morning with that in mind. Chapter 3, verse 18 through 20, begin with this notion of self-deception. The beginning phrase, let no one deceive himself, is basically saying to the, in the second personal pronoun, plural, he's pointing to them again in this tone of exhortation, don't deceive yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Don't think, in layman's terms, don't think that you are better than you really are. How many of us have fallen into that error before? For the Corinthian church, he is making this blindly clear that their acting and their way of life as a church is completely wrong. And again, church, we have not seen completely every error that's going on in the Corinthian church. But by the time we start getting to the later chapters, we're going to see that, that this church thought that they were good. I mean, we've repeated this once and time again. They, they had the gifts. They were doing all the gifts. They were prophesying. They were speaking in tongues. They were, they were doing amazing things. They, were, they thought they were celebrating the Lord's Supper correctly. And, and all of this stuff was happening on a weekly basis, but they were wrong because they were self-deceived. And this is why Paul has to confront it immediately within his letter. Do not deceive yourselves. Why are they being deceptive to themselves? Well, they think that their wisdom is better than everyone else. Because they think that in their wisdom, they are far superior. Let's go back to verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise, and look at the qualifier here, in this age, their wisdom made them believe that they were far better than anyone else. And according to their foolish wisdom, as we read earlier in, in chapters 1 and 2, this foolish wisdom gave them the, 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 the thought, the notion, that because those who were more wealthy and more powerful were far better than those who were of lower means. So this foolish wisdom, Paul is saying, don't think that you're okay because your wisdom is telling you you're okay. Because you've, you've made yourself believe you are okay. Nothing's wrong with me. I'm, I'm, we're, we're pretty good as a church. And then he qualifies it by saying, in this age. That, that's important. Because there is a wisdom of this age. There is intelligence of this age. However, that intelligence, when it stands before God, as we continue to read, is foolish. I want you to go back to chapter 1. Go to verse 17. Just to keep you refreshed in this notion. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom lest the cross of the Christ be emptied of its power. There it is. Not human wisdom. Look at verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Go to verse 21. 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Go to verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Go to chapter 2, verse 1. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Verse 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We get the tone, right? It, it's overemphasized. You may feel that we've been repeating ourselves and we're only repeating ourselves because Paul is repeating himself. Making it utterly clear that the wisdom of this age when it's in contrast to God's wisdom, it's total foolishness. And so for the Corinthians to think that they are wise for themselves, Paul is saying, do not deceive yourself. Don't lie to yourself. These are common references that we see throughout Scripture. Go, go to the Old Testament with me. I want you to see this in Job. Job makes a, a, a clear case for this, and then we're going to go to Psalm. In Job chapter 5, we see this. One of Job's friends makes a smart remark about this in Chapter 5, verse 13, he catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the schemes of the willy are brought to a quick end. Go to Psalm, Psalm 94. Look at what Psalm says. Psalm 94, verse 11. The Lord knows the thoughts of men, that they are but a breath. So this notion of being smart and wise in this age is a common deception for most to believe that in their wisdom, they are good enough. One of the, perhaps in this world's wisest men just passed away this week, Charles Munger. If you don't know that name, he was the associate or the second in command with the famous Warren Buffett. He was about 99 years old. I think he was about to be 100, and he, he passed away, obviously, of old age. But this man accumulated billions of dollars, was basically the brains behind Berkshire Hathaway and the investment company of Warren Buffett. And, and it was interesting to note that you know, all the stockholders in, in the Berkshire Hathaway company, everybody that owns stock, they, they have this, this once a year gathering of everybody that owns stock in that company. And if you own stock in that company, friend, I, I got to be your friend because like one stock in that company is about $400,000. So if you own one stock in that company, let, let me talk to you after the service. I'm just playing. But they would go out to Omaha and have their yearly convention in Omaha and and they made it a custom that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger would sit on the stage and, and just have a Q&A session with the people. And in the beginning years, it was a Q&A on, hey, what should I invest in? Uh, fi finances. Uh, what, what company should I be investing in? What, what should my portfolio look like? And as these men began to get older and older, got to their 90s, 80s, and 90s, the, these men were not asked questions on investing as much. Now it was on matters of life, on, on who should I date, and things like that. I, I would see some of these things, and it's like, what, why are they asking these guys who they should date? And, and young people, old people, they would ask them questions on, on just general thoughts of life. Because to them, these men made billions of dollars. They're obviously wise. So, friend, there is a wisdom of this age, but do not be self-deceived. I don't know if Charlie Munger gave his life to Christ at the end of his life, but if he didn't, 
the wisdom of this age is not going to help him in the age to come. He lived his best life for these 99 years he was here. But there's an eternity ahead of him. So friend, whether or not you're wise and you're qualified as wise in this age, do not be self-deceived because it isn't the wisdom of this world that saves you, but the folly of the cross. This is why Paul makes such a big emphasis on this for the Corinthian church. It's so easy for the Corinthian church to be caught up in the wisdom of that age. And so therefore, Paul gives them an alternative. He says, keep reading with me, go back to 1 Corinthians, verse 18. The second part of verse 18, let him become a fool that he may become wise. What is Paul saying here? Corinthian church, do not be self-deceived in your worldly wisdom. You must become a fool. Why? Because in becoming a fool means that you begin to accept the message of the cross. And that the cross of Christ is what eventually, inevitably, defines your life. Each person, therefore, must be watchful of themselves not to fall victim of self-deception. Therefore, the cure for self-deception is become a fool. How do you become a fool? Accept the message of the cross. And what does that imply? Well, we're going to read that in a bit. We're going to see what it implies in a bit. And we're going to see why the world will continuously see it as foolish and obnoxious why the message of the cross is so contrary to the wisdom of this age. There's a danger, my friends. The Corinthian church is being warned. There is a danger in self-deception, and it comes from within. The first area of attack is an internal attack on yourself. comes from within, where you think that you are better than you really are think you've got it all figured out. And this is what Paul begins to beat against the Corinthian church. Do not be self-deceived because then there's another attack that will come. Then others will feed you that self-deception as well by giving you false applause. The Corinthians at this point continue to outdo one another or try to outdo one another by taking for themselves the names of the best teachers that surrounded them, by trying to connect themselves with those who appear the wisest. So obviously if you're in the church and, you, and you're living off wisdom and you want to be wise and, and powerful, then you want your teachers or your influencers to be on the same level as you or a little bit more above. That's why these names continue to pop out. Keep reading with me. In verse 19, verse 19 and 20, For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. As they continue to outdo themselves, they want to continue to gather for themselves the notoriety that comes by attaching their names to famous names. But in this wisdom, Paul points to Scripture. It's interesting how Paul goes to the Scripture to prove his point. It isn't another philosophy. It isn't, I think, or you know what I think is best, or you know how I see things. Paul rarely ever uses his own intellect to prove his point, other than reinforcing a biblical point. What Paul usually does is what we see here. He goes back to Scripture. That's why there's so much Old Testament in Paul's writings that it's amazing to see how much Paul uses the Old Testament, not simply to remind people of God, but also to make sure they understand they have a correct view of God according to Scripture. 
The wisdom of this world is folly with God. He's quoting what we just read in Psalm and in Job. The thoughts of the wise are futile to God. Human thoughts are not hidden from God. That's what he is trying to say. In the wisdom of this age, in your own wisdom, you cannot hide your understanding from God. And so as they continue to attach themselves to wise men, not only in the church leadership but around the Corinthian way, they become more foolish to God. Foolish wisdom will only lead one to think about leadership in the wrong ways. You see, all the people that sat in those yearly conventions of Berkshire Hathaway, in those yearly uh, meetings with, with, stockhold, with stakeholders in the company, everyone looked at and looks at Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger with great eyes of adornment, of, of adoration, of wow. They look at that and they're amazed by it. Paul is saying, do not be fooled by the wisdom of this age. And do not try to attach yourself to leadership in such a way. Paul is going to go hard on church leadership in this next section. He prefaces it by these verses 21 and 20 through 23 by some incorrect views. Go back to verse 21. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Look at 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world of life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God. These names, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, we've continually heard them over and over again. And and we see why Paul keeps mentioning them. Because it, it is... He's attacking the intellect of the Corinthian way. He's making the point. Again, if we sound like a broken record, it's because Paul sees that the Corinthian church does not learn their lesson. And so as they continue to attach themselves to these men, thinking that they are theirs and they belong to them, Paul is trying to reverse their ideology and say, hey, you're Christ's. You're not Apollos's. You're not Paul's. And right now we're going to see why. But in them, they attach themselves because they believe that by attaching themselves to wise men, they'll get more wisdom. It's obvious, right? If I, if I follow Warren Buffett's advice on investments... Maybe my stock portfolio will probably grow in the same direction, up and to the right. He says, for all things are yours, in the second part of verse 21. This was a famous Stoic saying at the beginning of Stoic philosophy, which promoted human self-sufficiency. All things belong to wise men, is basically what the Stoic said. All things, everything belongs to those who are wise. But Paul says, no. It isn't that all things belong to the wise. It's that all things belong to those who belong to Christ. That's the real wisdom. And knowing that you have everything in this world because you have Christ. And you can look at yourself and say, well, I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to pay the bills. I can't even pay my rent. I'm worried about next month. What do you mean I have everything? Well, friend, in Christ, you have your eternal salvation. And in Christ, you should have the wisdom of Christ to move forward in life and not chase after foolish riches. Christ will make you a better steward. We just have to trust But these things, for Paul, continue to fall on the line of self-deception. One who glorifies in himself by attaching himself to those who are more powerful and more wise than they are. 
It's a foolish thing to do because you are boasting in yourself and in your own capability when you're standing before God. How foolish of a thing to do. If God is real, again, I believe God's real, and I pray that you believe God's real. If he is real, and if there is a heaven, if there is a judgment seat, can you imagine the Corinthian church standing with all their wisdom that they've gathered from the philosophy of the Corinthian way? And can you imagine them standing before God saying, we're, we're like almost at the same level. Can you imagine their ego and their arrogance to stand before God. Now look at ourselves. How do we do that? And how often do we stand before God and say, we got this. We got it all figured out. Do not deceive yourself. And he does this. How did Paul do it? Well, first you have to become a fool by accepting the message of the cross, which is foolish to the world. And then he says, he turns their logic upside down. Go back to verse 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours. He is talking about men that are servants of God. And we're going to see how we're to view them in chapter 4. But here, he puts them in the, in the category of servants. These leaders are, are not theirs in the sense that the people of the Corinthian church do not belong to them. It is... The people of the Corinthian church are not the property of the apostles. Rather, those men are servants of God, and therefore they are yours. Basically, what Paul is saying is, you're not mine, but because I'm a servant of God, I am yours. I serve God, and I serve God by serving you. And we're going to see how he qualifies servanthood in a bit. But it's, it's backwards. It isn't, it's, it's, the, it's the reverse pyramid form of leadership. It's, it's, from, it's from the top serving up. And, and it's serving the people rather than the people serving the leader. And this is what Paul is trying to get them to see. He's trying to get them to understand. You see the reverse of, of, of the wisdom of the world where leaders want to be served, but in the kingdom of God, it's backwards. It's upside down. It's the upside down triangle. Now we're, the leaders are the ones serving others. This is what they have to see. And then he goes on to say, life and death, present or future, all is yours. Basically, this world is not everything you've ever hoped for. You have it all here, but that's not your ultimate possession. That's not your ultimate prize. And that is for the Corinthian church, a wake-up call. Am I putting my emphasis, basically what Paul is getting them to realize is, am I putting my emphasis on my, my stability here on this world? Or am I seeking to build up treasures in heaven? Am I battling and striving for the gospel? Am I doing the things of God because I know that this world has nothing for me? So Paul says, everything's yours. You got it all. Because at the end of the day, you don't need anything. At the end of the day, what's going to survive is the fact that you have Christ. When you stand before Christ, Paul is basically getting them to understand you're not going to have your Roth IRA. You're not going to have your 401k. You're not going to have your Berkshire or Hathaway stock. You're not going to have anything. You're going to stand before God naked, spiritually. And if you have Christ, then you have it all. Remember that. And so as a Corinthian church sees this, they begin to get pressed again about the foolishness of the gospel of Christ because it goes contrary to what they understand. P Paul says, pardon me, my, my throat is a little dry from uh, this past weekend of feverish, coldish type of 
uh, feeling, but this is what Paul begins to address to every Corinthian member. And this, my friends, is for me a heavy, heavy burden for this church that we understand that we belong to Christ. Paul will repeat this in Galatians when he says, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You have an inheritance. And it's, it's the promise of God for you. And then he says in Galatians chapter 5, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. It's not only that we have an inheritance, but we've also realized that we have to crucify our flesh and the passions and its desires. Those people who belong to Christ have it all. Yes, Christ belongs to God. Why does Paul say that? Is, is this subordination? Is it making Christ inferior to God? No, the way Christ is a servant to God, the way Christ served God as a servant in this world, that's basically what he is saying, which will model the leadership of, of, of the next chapter. Servanthood. As Christ is God's, the model that we are to follow and to regard as perfect. Now go with me to, the, to chapter 4. How are we to think about these leaders and leadership? It's an interesting fact. It's interesting to note that, that Paul begins to focus their attention on, on the leadership again. Kind of what we've been talking about here. How do we regard others? How do we regard leaders? And then most importantly, how do we regard leaders in the church? Which in a lot of cases and a lot of stories have come about when, when people leave certain churches because they felt that the leadership abused them. Or they left churches because the leadership did something wrong to them. And leadership often takes on a negative connotation in our modern day. And so Paul wants to make sure that he addresses it, even in the first century, false notions of leadership. Because if you have a false notion of leadership, then you will be disappointed. Then there will come a time where that leader will disappoint you, especially if he's in the church. So us leaders aren't exempt from from, from, you know, being exhorted in Paul's message. Even pastors have to be careful and on the lookout. But it's important for all of us to understand how we are to regard these leaders. Go back to chapter 4 now, verse 1. This is how one should regard us. Now, Paul is obviously including himself in this phrase here. And he's talking about Cephas. He's talking about Apollos. He's talking about himself. How are you to regard us as your leaders in this church? It's all the people. He, he even mentions in verse, verses 5 through 9, Paul and Apollos as diaconos, ministers, helpers of the church. This is who they are. That's what they are. They're helpers. What is Paul saying about himself? I'm only a helper. I'm only an assistant. I'm a minister. I, 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 I'm a diaconos. I, I, I help others. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4 again, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. How are they to look at leadership? Well, huperete. That's one way, that's one word, servants of Christ here. It's not, he's not using the doulos word here of slave, but a servant, an uperete, a helper, one who labors as a free person, learning his task and goal from someone that is above him. Someone who has surrendered their leadership or their autonomy to serve someone else that is far superior than themselves. They are serving another person. They're not a slave at that point. They're a servant. I'm here because I want to serve you. And in this case, this is what Apollos, this is what Cephas, this is what Paul is supposed to be doing. They're serving God. 
They're learning everything from him to serve him. And as they serve him, they serve the church. That's why John Mark is Barnabas and Paul's uperete. It's a servant, servant, person who serves a superior. And then he also says this, the word steward, oikonomoi. This Greek word of, of, of stewardship is important here because they're, they're stewards of the mysteries of God. Again, under the service of God, they're stewards of God's mysteries. This gives an account of the master of the house. What is a steward? Basically a manager of the household. And we got all the building metaphors in chapter 3 early on. We, we know where, where Paul's going here. We know that building, and, and then in, in later, last week we talked about the temple. All this building metaphor is making the case for leadership that therefore the house is not theirs. It's not Paul's house. It's not Cephas' house. It's not Apollos' house. It's not Jonathan's house. It's God's house. Paul, Cephas, Apollos are all to regard themselves as simply managers of the house. They oversee operations. They don't own the mysteries that, they're, that they've been given, but they're called to distribute the mysteries to others. And they must be aware as a manager that they have to give an account to the owner of the house. Managers know who their owner, who their leader is, and they know that they have to give clear accounting of everything that comes in and everything that comes out because they're managers. In general here, the perspective for Paul is also for everyone else who gives the mysteries of God. In general, this applies to you and me. We're all servants of God and therefore managers of the mysteries of God. So friends, you will give an account of God's mysteries. What do you, you may think to yourself right now, like, wait, what was that? I just woke up. I just woke up and you told me that I'm a manager. Like, did I just get promoted? In God's house, in God's family, you're a manager of the mysteries of God as well. You've been given the gospel. You haven't been given the gospel to keep it to yourself. You've been given the gospel to distribute it, to manage it, to speak about it. And as a manager, not an owner, and as a, as a servant of the, of the master of the household, you're going to give an account for that asset. What will you do with that mystery? And how will you respond to God when it's time for you to give an account? for everything he's given you. What is the emphasis here? What is Paul trying to say? He's basically reaffirming the leadership style of Jesus Christ over again. We see this time and time again from the very beginning of the Corinthian letter. This is, for Paul, the important element of Christian leadership. They are to serve as Jesus did. Because Jesus is the one that said, the greatest among you shall be a servant. Perete. Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is the one that said, if anyone would be first, he must be last. And a servant of all. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Servant, my friends, implies that you obey the master of the house. And in the service to the master of the house, the orders are for proper accounting and distribution of the mysteries of God. That means, my friends, that we tell others about the gospel, and that also means that we're involved with others. It's a church. It's not isolation. 
You're not called to Christ's family by isolation. You're called to Christ's church. You're called to serve one another. You're called to build the body of Christ up by serving one another. How do you do that? Are you doing that? Or are you disconnecting yourself little by little from the body of Christ until eventually you can think of yourself as an appendix, as a vestigial organ that doesn't need to be in the body? You must serve the, the master of the house. You must serve his household. What's the most important element in a servant? Go to verse 2. Moreover, it is required of a steward's that they be found faithful. That's it. Do you need the wisdom of this world? Do you need the riches of this world? Do you need all the, 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 the power of this world and authority? No, you need to be faithful. You need to be the smartest one here? No. There's plenty of you that are smarter than me. You need to be faithful. Paul is telling the Corinthian church, all of these men are only serving God, and they will ultimately be tested, as we saw earlier in chapter 3, those verses where they're tested by fire. God will test them, and God will test the leaders of this household, and when they are tested by fire, they, their faithfulness will be proven. God looks at faithfulness. And to assess a leader then is not to assess how good they can talk, how good of a rhetorician he is, how much philosophy he knows, how good he could stand with the philosophers of the Corinthian way. No. The people are to regard their leaders as faithful. Jesus says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over the little. I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. This is something Jesus consistently spoke about, especially in parables like Matthew chapter 25. Good and faithful servant. This is the same phrase he uses for the one who stands before judgment in Matthew chapter 7 and stands before God on the judgment day. And will you hear those words? Everyone here should have one goal in mind. Forget about making the million dollars by your, by your 40th birthday. Forget about being the most successful entrepreneur in this world. Forget about all of that. Charlie Munger had all of that. Forget about that. What you want to hear, what you should be striving for, is to hear those words come from the mouth of God. Welcome, good and faithful servant. That's what you should be striving for here. And leaders as well, pastors as well, this is what should be on their hearts. And a good leader, therefore, is identified by how faithful he commits himself to the things of God. So many leaders in, in, in our modern culture fall to the wayside continuously because they've been distracted by the pleasures of this world. So many leaders fall into sexual temptation. So many leaders start stealing money. So many leaders and pastors go away and do horrible things because they've lost the vision of what it means to be a faithful servant of God. And, and a leader, my friend, therefore, must serve God faithfully by giving and distributing his mysteries faithfully. Be careful with those who are speak incredibly, have vast amount of fame and fortune all over the place. I was just reminded of several this week on, uh, on my YouTube channel. They just keep popping up. False teachers from around the world, and especially the United States. Big men, big names 
thousands upon thousands of people in their congregations, and they fall. And they, they prove to be unfaithful. Most of them did 30 years of ministry. Others did 40 years of ministry. One here in Chicago was going on 45 years of ministry. Someone that I looked up to. And he was found unfaithful for years. They could be great leaders. They could be great entrepreneurs. They could be great vision casters. They could be great talkers. They could be incredibly wise according to this world. I remember seeing a pastor, or the pastor that I'm referencing, in a conference. And, and I was so amazed because he sat with Colin Powell. I was like, what? And then the next year he sat with Bill Clinton. I was like, what? This guy's talking to world leaders. And then the next time I saw him, he was speaking to the CEO of HP. And then the next time I, 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 I saw him talking, he was talking to the CEO of Starbucks covertly because the Starbucks people were, were embarrassed that their CEO was at a church conference. I was like, wow. You're talking to all these big-time people. But he was living a life of sin and deceit. He was not faithful. And friend, the leaders that you follow in the churches that you go to, your leaders must be faithful. And faithfulness comes not by the popularity of your leaders, but how faithful they are to distributing God's word to the people. That's what you want in your leaders. Because you know that, that they tremble when they come up here. Leaders that are pastors in congregations, what well, Paul is saying, Cephas and Apollos, all these guys, don't think that they're far better than you. They all are serving God. And they're afraid. Every pastor should be in fear of how they guide their church and how they preach to their church. Find a pastor that can preach God's word unbashfully, unashamedly, and truthfully, honestly, and with integrity, and see his life back it up. At the end, Paul addresses his final claim for himself. This last verses here, Paul points to himself now. Basically what most pastors should do in times like this. Paul says in verse 3 to 5, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive commendation from God above. What does God say about me is Paul's main prerogative. Paul's not trying to be a showboat guy here. He's not trying to be pull off his authority. He's not kind of saying, I don't care what you say about me. No, no, no. He, he, he's basically saying, you could say good things about me. You could say bad things about me. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because what only matters is what God says about me. He even says, even myself, I can't even think or self-deceive myself, right? Because it's easy to be self-deceived. Oh, I'm doing a good job. It looks like I'm doing good. I've written some letters to the Corinthian church. I'm writing letters to Ephesus. I'm writing letters here and there. I'm planting churches. I could be good. Yeah, I'm a good guy. I'm, I'm moving forward. I'm a good steward of the household of God. No, it doesn't matter what even himself says about himself. But what does God say about him? Stewards, my friends, will be tested by God's fire, public opinion does not matter in context to God's opinion of yourself. What Paul thinks of himself is not important. His conscience, therefore, stands clear with those in Corinth. At least he says, I've got nothing to hide. Because if he does have something to hide, what does he say? In verse 5, God will bring these things to light. Yes, 
God will bring these things to light. Friends, everything about you that is in darkness will come to light. And at least at this moment, can you say what Paul says? My conscience is clear. Go ahead. Look at my internet history. Go ahead. Look at my, my phone. Go ahead. Look at my apps. Go ahead. Go on my Snapchat. Go ahead. Go on my Instagram DMs. Go ahead. Look at all my accounts. Look at my bank accounts. See where I'm putting my money. Go ahead. Is your conscience clear before God? As Paul says, for myself, for himself, my conscience is clear because he knows that the day of the Lord is coming and darkness will not be able to hide when the Lord of light comes and it will ultimately reveal the deepest secrets of the heart. Friends, what does your heart reveal about you? I want to leave you with several psalms here so you could hear the psalmist say from the depths of his soul, you have tried my heart, you have visited me by night, you have tested me, and you will find nothing I have proposed that my mouth will not transgress. Psalm 26, verse 2, Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. Psalm 44, 21, Would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Friends, the day will come when God will give us praise for our faithfulness. So that day comes, my friends, that's your audience. That's my audience as a leader in this congregation. Stand firm throughout this time and be ready to meet God on the day of the Lord. Why don't you stand with us this morning and prepare your hearts for Communion Sunday.